Thank you, Chris. I, I want to begin by, by thanking the minister for making my day. I'm, I'm one of those people who actually believes that climate change is the single biggest economic challenge we face over the next 50 years, and I live in Ottawa. So it's nice to come to a place where somebody's actually doing something about climate policy. I'm also hoping, Chris, after you give us the gold medal, that a John Weeb will come and give me a cup for perfect attendance. I've been coming to this to Globe since it started. And in fact, I suddenly realized at 4 o'clock this morning that in the original Globe meeting, my institute was announced and created. And the Articles of Association for ISD were signed here by Lucien Bouchard. Remember him? Uh, who was then the Canadian Federal Environment Minister, and Gary Fellman, the Premier of Manitoba. So, John, I guess you and I are sort of joined at the hip. Now, if you've ever seen John Weeb and me standing together, that's a kind of horrible visual image. <laughs> Think sort of Queen Mary or cruise liner stuck together. Uh, I'm also delighted to be here, because this serves, I think, as a real antidote to what I did on my winter vacation. And on my winter vacation, I went to a, one of the world's most charming cities located on the Baltic Sea. You'll get it in a minute. It has a little mermaid in the harbor. But one of its most outstanding features is a conference center, which is built to hold 15,000 people, into which the Danish government and the, and the UN decided to put 30,000 people. So if you can visualize the scene, you can see what it's like outside today, lower the temperature by about 15 degrees, and stand out there between three, four, five, or six hours, waiting to get into the room. And when you get into the building, discover the rooms are even fuller than this. And when you finally get into a room, which is a great triumph, you discover that there's nothing happening. <laughs> so. After your five hours and your, 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 uh, your, your pneumonia and all the other diseases you acquired waiting to get in, you finally discover that your goal is nothing. There's not a thing going on. And that is genuinely depressing. And I think we have to remember uh, from this conference what Diane was saying at the beginning, which is that the only lesson I drew from all of the climate gate from the well-orchestrated conspiracy to make the IPCC discredited is that the one thing that's really wrong with the IPCC report is that it's probably too optimistic. Uh, and that the assumptions they made, given the science that's, that's occurred since then, are, are truly frightening. I don't want to begin a discussion by, by, by talking about gloom and doom, but the fact is we don't have much time. And I, I've discovered in, in meetings in the last year or two that that's more business as usual. We tweak this and fiddle around here a bit. Things will happen a bit faster. We actually have to make a major dent in global CO2 emissions between now and the year 2020. Uh, with all due respect to the minister who's not of this stripe, it's very easy for politicians to agree to a 75% cut by 2050 because we'll all be dead by then. But you don't get to a 75% cut by 2050 by doing nothing between now and 2020. So a green economy for me is fairly simple. I, I, I think that the, the key to it is to, to do something about carbon emissions. The key to it is to keep carbon emissions at least at 450, which is becoming rather dangerous at this stage, and to stop this kind of casual chat that you now hear about people saying, well, maybe it's three degrees, maybe we'll have to live with four, maybe we'll have to live with five. A planet at 5 degrees centigrade increased temperatures, average temperatures, would be a catastrophic place to live. So this is not a kind of interesting idea we might fiddle around with. This is something we actually have to get going on and doing very quickly. I think also I can sense in the discussion, for a long time we had this false dichotomy in the climate change debate. If you were in favor of doing something about adaptation, that meant you've given up on mitigation. And therefore, it was verboten to talk about ad adopting to climate change or adapting to climate change. I think that's now gone away. I think most of the people in the business agree that you have to both mitigate CO2 emissions and adapt to the climate change that's already happening. And that's very evident in, in what the British Columbia government is doing. But I think there's another false dichotomy emerging now as well, and that is between bottom-up and top-down approaches. And the failure, the, the constipation of the international process is being used as an excuse by people to say, well, we got to get off this bottom-up stuff. And that's right, we do. And, and given the absence of national policy in North America, 
it's being done from the bottom up. It's being done by cities like Vancouver. It's being done by the Western Climate Initiative. It's being done by governments like, uh, like the ministers. And that's absolutely critical. But do not walk away from the fact that sooner or later we have to come to an international agreement to control greenhouse gas emissions. And the trick is we have to do that at the same time as providing a greener economy, which to me internationally is an economy that reduces greenhouse gas emissions and has a much greater degree of equity than what we have today. The developing countries are going to have to be brought along. And I think the defining nature of Copenhagen was that it really crystallized this tectonic shift in political power in the world. I mean, no longer, I mean, we cannot have an international agreement without the United States. But having only the United States pretending to do it on its own is no longer sufficient. And so what happens in China and India and Brazil and the other big developing countries is going to be just as critical to our future as anything else. And I won't go on, I can say this in the question, but I would suggest that you keep an eye, particularly on China and India, because there's a big difference between the governmental rhetoric at international meetings and what China and India are actually doing about inventing their way out of the climate dilemma. Uh, and in fact, I think it's now got far enough in China that the United States is now beginning to worry that the Chinese may be taking over the, the scientific and technological leadership in things like electric cars, solar energy, and wind power. So while there are lots of encouraging signs, we can't just progress along at a stately pace. We actually have to get going and fast and hard, and we have to bring along most of the developing world. And that will entail a whole bunch of ingenious political compromises, as well as rethinking how the technological map of the world is drawn. Thank you, Chris.